we're going to talk about edge work. But to get to edge work, we have to work our way to the edge. We don't start at the edge with the client. And so where we start is really where we start is with building a relationship. That's the most important thing, and building trust. And the way we do that, one way we do that is by being generous. So instead of doing a taster session or, you know, we've, we've talked about this, instead of doing like a 30-minute taster session or something, we say, I'll give you a two-hour session. Let's get together. Let's block out the time so we can really have a meaningful conversation. And we do our best in that conversation to serve them as if we were never going to see them again. We try to change their lives in that one conversation. And then we, if it goes well and it seems like a good fit, at the end of that conversation, we have our enrollment conversation. And if we enroll the client, we're now in the, you know, now, now we're, we're in contracting, meaning we're getting an agreement about what it's going to look like to work together. And then we're off to the races. And so then we're coaching them. And when we're coaching them, by the, and by the way, I don't have slides for this. But everything I'm going to, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is on your bingo card. Because this is just the core, basic, nuts and bolts, nitty gritty stuff. So you have the five stages, the six questions, levels of creation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, but let's just sort of see how it makes the foundation for being able to do um, edge work. So the, what are the five stages? The first stage is contracting. When you engage with a client, you have a contracting phase. I mean, you could call it an agreement phase, but then it wouldn't begin with C. But it's you're agreeing about how you're going to work together. And then in any session, you're going to say, all right, so you just agree on what you're going to work on in that session. So the first stage is contracting. What's the second stage? Curiosity. Curiosity. We don't know what they're talking about, or what their problems are, or whatever. So the first thing we need to do is a lot of listening and being curious and asking questions. That's evocation, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So we're, we're curious. We're asking questions. And we're trying to understand the situation. And then the third stage is clarity. <laughs> so clarity is after they talk about it and they help us understand what's really going on, we need to get clear about what it is they're trying to create. What is the ideal scenario? What, is, what would it look like if whatever they presented wasn't a problem? Or what is it, what's their be if they're on a quest? And that sort of thing. We need to get clear. And then what do we do? Creativity. So then we're going to generate options and possibilities, things that they could do or think about or be differently, be different. So we're going to create possibilities. Okay, And then commitment, right? So out of all of these possibilities, what are they committing to? So five stages, contracting, curiosity, clarity, creativity, and commitment. Every session has, goes through those five stages in some degree or another, or, or probably should at least touch on all of those five. Now, one way to do that is... Um, you have to understand that coaching is a quest. When the client comes to us and they ask for what they want, they're either asking for B or they're asking for you know, the best that they can imagine. And we don't know what's possible for them. If they knew what was possible and they knew what they wanted, they wouldn't, have to, they wouldn't need a coach, right? So they come to us for help as a thinking partner and support, an ally, to help them figure out what could be possible and to create more options, and, uh, you know, a bigger bottle for them. And so, <clears throat> and so, um, so coaching is always a quest. We, we don't know exactly where the conversation is going to go. But the closest thing there is to a map in Coaching from Essence is the six questions. The first question is, how can I help? Or some variation of that. Please don't think that you ask these questions word for word. You make it natural, right? But it's some version of how, how can I help? What do you want to talk about today? Uh, what's the biggest challenge you're facing? What would be the most valuable thing we could talk about? However you want to phrase it. 
And that's really, that's the contracting phase. You're agreeing what you're gonna work on. And then the second question is, um, so what's the situation? Help me understand the, you know, help me understand the scope of what we're talking about so that I, I understand what it is you're trying to, uh, the problem you're trying to solve or what you're trying to accomplish. And then the third question is, all right, so what would your ideal scenario be? What would it look like if, there was, if this wasn't a problem or if you created this and it was the best that you could imagine? In other words, what's your B? What would that look like? And then the next question, and this is the really important question, and that is, why don't you have it right now? And again, don't be attached to the way it's phrased. You know, find the whatever feels natural. But basically what you're asking them is, what needs to be different or what's missing? Um, but the important thing about this question is, is they're gonna give you a list of what needs to be different. And if they're not on it, you've gotta put them on the list. I don't know where this question comes from, maybe NLP or something, but a really good question to ask if someone comes to you with a problem is how did you create, promote, or allow this to become a problem? They need to be on the list. If they say, you know, if they're trying, let's say you're coaching an entrepreneur and they're saying, you know, I, I, I'm working on this startup and everything, but you know, we don't have the money and I don't have the right people and my team isn't getting along and all of that, if they're not on the list, you've got work to do. They've got to be on the list. Once you have that list, that's your work. You know the saying, the obstacle is the way? These are the obstacles, that's the way, that's the work. So you look at those and you say, all right, well, what would be the thing that we could work on that would have the greatest impact on creating what you wanted or solving the problem that you have? And, and what could we do about that? What, what have you tried already? You ask them what they've tried because you don't want to just make suggestions and have them say, oh, I tried that, it didn't work. Uh, I, nah, I tried that, it didn't work. So, all right, so what have you tried so far? All right, and what happened? What did you learn from that? Okay, so what else could you do? And we help them create some possibilities. That's the creati creativity stage, right? And then finally, so we're asking them, what could you do? And then we say, what will you do? So out of those possibilities, what are you willing to commit to? What are you gonna work on? Now you won't get through all of those necessarily in every session. If you don't get through all of those, it doesn't mean you've had a bad coaching session. You might spend a lot of time just talking about ideal scenario. You may spend a whole session just helping them clarify and challenging and making sure it's a real B, it's theirs, it's congruent, it's not a bonsai dream. And, everything we talked about yesterday. Um, you may not get to something for them to do. You may just leave them with something to think about or something to be. You know, so triple loop learning, I always keep that in mind. Um, so that's, the, that's sort of the map, okay? Now, the way I think, I said this before, but the way I think about it is A to B is a kind of map Futurosity continuum, I think of as the compass. You know, are you pointed toward the future or are you, are you headed north or south, you know? Um, this is, the six questions are kind of map. And if you ever get lost, you ask the wayfinding question. Like if the person is giving you a lot of stuff, or sometimes clients will do a download. I never interrupt a client who's doing a download because I'm always listening for the levels of creation. What can I learn about their beliefs and their values and identity and so forth? A lot of times the content isn't important, but what's speaking is important. I'm always listening for what's speaking. What kind of story is it? Is it a story about, um, you know, is it a story about fear? Is it a story about judgment? Like it, anything could be speaking. So I'm listening for that. <clears throat> so you're, you're, you let the client do their download and then you, and then you can, uh, and, then you, and while they're doing that, you're listening for levels of creation. So beliefs, identity, and so forth. And then you ask them what they want to create. So keep in mind, levels of creation and triple loop learning 
are the two sort of frameworks that I think about when I'm, when I'm listening to a client. <clears throat> Levels of creation is kind of the backpack. That's what they have to work with. And then when we're coming up with possibilities, what I'm asking is, where do I have the most leverage? If we changed one of these things, what would have the biggest impact again? Is it a question of beliefs? Is it their identity is getting in the way? Is it their values and priorities are out of alignment with what they're trying to create or the problem they're trying to solve? Is it more external? Is it about the people, places, things, i.e. resources? Is this the wrong time, et cetera? So those are all the things I'm thinking about when I'm listening and when I'm giving them input or giving them things to think about, okay? That is the 20% of what I do that's 80% of the results I get as a coach. If you really get that in your bones, that'll keep you busy for a long time. You'll never be at a loss for what to do. But if you are, if the client gives you a download and you have no idea where to begin, you use the wayfinding question. You say, oh, interesting. So, so you've given me a lot there. If you were to distill down everything that you just told me to the one question you most wanted an answer to, what would the question be? I've never not have had someone distill it down to a question. And then that's where you start. Okay, so you're never lost. <clears throat> okay, so that's the, that's the core of coaching. I'm not gonna go into levels of creation too much or anything because that's, it's very straightforward. You have it there. And so now, now we, we, we know sort of what we're doing. We know what we're doing in a coaching session. We have a lot of skills to draw on. Now let's go sort of bigger picture. Bigger picture, coaching, I think, good coaching is evocation and provocation. What do I mean by that? A lot of coaching comes from Rogerian psychology, Carl Rogers, you know, which is active listening, and the client is always gonna make their decisions and they're resourceful and whole and, you know. Um, from my perspective, that's only half of the equation. If the client was whole and they knew what to do for themselves, they don't really need you as a coach. I mean, we're sounding boards, and that can be helpful. We don't make decisions for clients, but we sometimes have expertise to share or knowledge to share, or we can see things that they can't. And so we, for me, good coaching is more active than that. Evocation is drawing the client out, drawing out what's already there, helping them see and surface what resources they have, um, that's evocation. And we do that mainly by active listening and asking questions. And, um, you know, it's very straightforward, basic listening and questioning, okay? But that, that's evocation. So what is provocation? Provocation is tapping on their bottle. It's challenging them a little bit. It's making observations about their blind spots. It's challenging their beliefs, pointing out that they have a belief that might be limiting. Um, it's challenging their identity. It's, it's challenging their self-interest, status-seeking, scarcity, and survival. It's um, making them aware of all those things. It's making them more responsible or accountable for what they're creating. It's putting them on the list of why they don't have what they want or why they have the problem that they have. So how do you think about provocation? <clears throat> provocation is all about trust. <clears throat> So you can think of how provocative you are uh, depends largely on how much trust you have in the relationship. And you can think of a continuum. <coughs> on one end of the continuum, 
The least provocative is what I call a disturbing question. And <clears throat> as we get more provocative, I call it a provocation. It doesn't look like provocation, but that's what it says. And so that's how you think about it. The higher the trust, the more provocative you can be. So what is a disturbing question? A disturbing question is, just think of it as sort of an unpleasant question. Uh, one example is, I, I shared the story of this person that I coached for you know, five or 10 minutes, this woman who wanted to, to you know, manage some salespeople or whatever. A disturbing question was, I said, how come you're not, how come you don't want to be the VP of sales? Like I tapped on her bottle a little bit. It was a pretty light tap, but it was a disturbing question. I did a dream session with a guy once who said, who, a CEO who said, you know, my problem is my head of HR sucks and uh, my CTO sucks. And I said, who hired them? That was a disturbing question. Like he didn't want to hear that the reality was he was responsible for all this. So, um, so that's just an example. You ask them a, a challenging question. Provocation could be a request. So, so more down the continuum, higher heat, if you will, uh, could be a request. You, you ask the client to conduct an experiment that's risky. So you're coaching someone and they're on a quest and they're really hesitant about doing something and you, you ask them to do something that might be risky. You say something like, you know, you've been talking about doing a workshop forever. Why don't you just commit right now that you're going to do a half-day workshop in the next two months? Commit right now and, you know, post on LinkedIn right now that you're going to do it. Or... Um, a provocation was I was coaching someone once who was talking about thought leadership and how she wanted to write all this stuff and she was working on getting all her thoughts together and she had all that, she had written some posts but she didn't want to post them yet. And I said, why don't you post it right now? Why don't you take your, the post that you think is the best and most finished and let's post it on LinkedIn right now. And she wouldn't do it but she said, Okay, I, I won't do it right now because I want to keep talking, but I promise I'll do it today. And she did. And I have seen so many posts from that person now, and I know that she got some clients from it, but she was afraid to do it. So I had to provoke her. I had to tap a little harder on her bottle. So a request for action or a challenge, challenging someone, or making an observation, just one second, or making an observation that um, could be uh, not very easy to take in. So you're working with someone who is, um, you know, you're working with a leader who is not showing up very well. And you have to tell that person that they're being kind of an asshole. That would be a provocation, okay? So you're making an observation about their behavior. Or you're challenging a belief. Um, <laughs> I just happened to catch Vanessa's eye. Uh, you know, Vanessa, we've had some provocative conversations. Um, so you, so you, you know, that's tapping on somebody's bottle. You're helping them see a blind spot. You're challenging them to take action and, and get out of their paralysis. You're challenging them to do something they're afraid of. That's kind of bordering on, now we're into edge work, right? It's not just a provocation, but we're really challenging them to step into an edge. And I'll, and I'll come back to that and talk about edge work in a minute. Daniel. Thank you, Robert. So one thing is, I think even just the question of why don't you have it right now and putting yourself on the list, yeah. that is a fundamentally disturbing question. Yes. Um, I think it would be an interesting conversation. We probably don't have time for it right now. Maybe this is a coffee break conversation just yep. to share some of our most provocative yeah. questions that we've asked. Sure. I 
think I was channeling you some time ago and have had this curve in mind when mm. I had a client who similarly had some thought leadership dreams and was frustrated in the coaching relationship and mm -hmm. had not been returning my calls. And we finally had a conversation where she said, yeah, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I just really want a coach that will tell me what to do. And I'm like, well, you know, you, you haven't been doing a lot of the things that you said you were going to do. Right. And I'll tell you what, I'll fire you if you don't write one of the articles that's on the lists of the things that we've been generating. Yeah. And she, it was a very provocative moment because I think she was expecting to break up with me. Yeah. Like, I, it was sort of a George, I'm not, I'm going to break up with you. Right. But it was really like, look, if you really don't know if this is right for you and you really don't, you haven't been doing what you say you're going to do, then if you don't do what you yeah. are going to say you're going to do, then we don't, that, that's fine. Yeah. And sure as shooting, she said, I will, I will write that first article. Mm -hmm. And, and just like with yours, she kept writing more. So, I mean, it's just, I just having that graph in mind of like, <laughs> just, you know, pulling the dial and, and then just, and then just kicking it to 11 when it's the right time is always very helpful. Yeah. So that, thank that's you. A, that's a great story because, um, always call the client's bluff. You have to you have to feel confident and secure in yourself to do it. But always call the client's bluff if they say something like that, or if they say, "I don't know about continuing," you know, whatever you say, that that's fine. You know, if you feel this isn't right for you, um, you know, help me understand what would have to be different for this to be good for you, or what's missing for you. That's fine, but. Um, you know, always call the client's bluff. I had a client, um, I mean, this, this isn't the exact same thing, but so I, I had a client who came to me, this was a transitional client, three months. She was very unhappy in what she was doing. She was a very, you know, successful executive at a high tech company, but she didn't feel like she was being treated very well and wasn't feeling respected. And so sort of the presenting issue was she wanted to find another job. And so we were going to go on a quest to help her find her ideal job. And I had her literally going on a quest. She had a spreadsheet. She had homework every week. She was going to go to networking events and talk to people and do some informational interviews to see about doing different things and all of this stuff. And she did, within a month, she had like two job offers. But they weren't what she wanted. And so. She, in the meantime, she kept bitching about how unhappy she was where she was. So finally, I said, as a provocation, I said, great, so here's your homework this time. I want you to get fired. You, you keep telling me you want to leave, so, and, you, and you won't do it yourself, so I want you to get fired. What would you have to do to get fired? She said, well, I'd have to ask for a raise and a promotion. And I said, all right. Your homework is to go ask for a raise and a promotion. And of course, she didn't do it right away. But um, when we were ending the three months, she had asked for a raise and a promotion. And she was in negotiations with her manager for a raise and a promotion. So that was a provocation. That was, I sort of called her bluff. If you hate it so much, then, and you won't quit, then get fired. And so, and it worked, you know, for, well, I think it worked. I don't know exactly what happened after that. But the, the one thing to keep in mind here is, again, this trust is really important. So when I'm doing a dream session, I will almost always ask, if I see an opportunity, I'll almost always ask a disturbing question. And the reason for that is that one of my criteria for an ideal client is that they're coachable. I want to see what they do if I challenge them. If I tap on their bottle and they get all defensive, um, they're probably not going to be a good client for me. I want a client who will say, who will, who will open up to it and consider it, or who will say, no, that's really interesting, but I don't think that fits. Like if they, if they push back, that's fine. But I want someone who will engage and who's open, will consider my input and so forth. So I almost always try to work in a disturbing question in the dream session to see how coachable they are. Rarely am I provocative in a dream session. 
I want to build trust first. Um, the exception to that is if I am not sure whether or not I want to work with somebody. Uh, I might be more provocative then because, again, I want to see how they'll engage. Um, so, but if you're, if you're going to be really provocative or you, if you're going to do edge work, you have to create safety. If you're, it's like, have any of you ever been mountain climbing? Okay, it's like you're on belay, right? You're telling the person to climb that mountain and go after their dream. They've got to trust that you're their ally and you've got the rope. So it takes time to build that. Um, so let me just check in with you. How is this so far? Good? So, so evocation and provocation. Many coaches do primarily evocation. To, I think good coaching is both. Um, and, and if we build enough trust and we're provocative enough, we're tapping on their bottle and helping them to get a bigger bottle, we're challenging their be limiting beliefs and identity and so forth, the client starts to open up and things get more spacious. Often, as you do this over time, clients will bring more and more personal stuff to the table. And then you can do deeper personal work, which is then, you know, obviously really satisfying. So you have to build trust before you can do edge work. So what is edge work? Um, <clears throat> Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers was a, yeah. Is there like a ratio of evocation to provocation? It, it really depends on the client and where they are. So, um, you know, usually early in, early in the relationship, I'll be more evocative. I'll draw them out. I'll be much more curious. I'll let them story tell much more generally. Uh, the exception to that is that I do introduce models early. Like I always do A to B. Depending on the client, I might introduce triple loop learning or I might introduce levels of creation or whatever. So in the first few sessions, I'm, I'm going to share the models with them sort of just in time. I don't say, okay, here's, here's a, a curriculum. Here's some language that we're going to use. What I say is, a to B, I say, in the first session, I say, look, let me just give you a way to think about what we've talked about. All you're really trying to do is get from A to B, you know, and then I give them that whole model. And then in the second session, I may talk about triple loop learning or something. Or I may say levels of creation because I'll point out something like, you know, that's a belief or that sounds like an identity. You're really attached to seeing yourself this way, and that's getting in the way. If I start working with levels of creation, then I, start, then I show them the whole model. I say, look, let me, let me give you a way to, to think about this. We, I've talked about, I've pointed out some beliefs that you have. I've talked about how some of this is related to your identity. Let me show you a way to think about that, and then I'll describe levels of creation to them. Um, and again, for anybody who doesn't know it, levels of creation as it's not really my model, it's, it's um, logical levels or neurological levels. It comes from neurolinguistic programming and Gregory Bateson, and if you want to learn more, but uh, I saw that model and I sort of adapted it and talk about it and use it in a way that I think is, is different. But if you want to learn more about that, that's where it comes from. I like to call it levels of creation because we're trying to create things, and it's really helpful to know what level we need to focus on in order to create what we want to create or to solve whatever problem we're dealing with. And if you have those, uh, if you, you know, you have that on your uh, bingo card, but it's basically you have your essence, you have your vision, you have your identity, beliefs, uh, values, capabilities, really knowledge, skills, and abilities and then you have your behaviors or actions, and then you have the environment. People, places, things, resources, and time. If you have the right things in all of those levels, and you have enough of the right things, and they're aligned, then success is pretty much assured. It's just a matter of time. So what you're helping the client do is make sure they have the right things in each of those levels. 
And do they have enough of the right things? Do they have enough resources? Do they have enough capability? If they don't have it, maybe they can hire someone or partner with someone or whatever it is. But do they have the right things, enough of the right things, and are they all aligned? Okay. So, <clears throat> so we have all this stuff to work on. And now we're developing a trusted relationship. And we've been a little bit provocative. We've tapped on their bottle. Usually in the first three or four sessions, I've shared those basic models. And I tell them, listen, it's really important that we have shared language so we know how to talk about what we're doing. We're on a quest. And when, we, and when they present a problem and we're solving that problem, that's another mini quest. It's like, okay, so what's the quest here? What's your question? What, um, you know, let's, what experiments can we try? What can we try to solve this? So I, I, that language is incredibly helpful for, for coaching because it gives you a common way to talk about what you're doing. So, uh, so I share that, all, all of those core models, usually in the first three to five sessions with the client. And then, I, and then, as appropriate, I can tap a little harder on their bottle and be more provocative. I never break someone's bottle from the outside. We talked about that before. To me, that is abuse. I always look out for the client's safety. I always want to respect the trust that I'm building. I never want a client to doubt that I'm their ally. Um, what I want to do is help them break the bottle from the inside. And that's what edge work does. What provocation does is taps on their bottle from the outside and says, hey, look, you know, wake up in there and, and start breaking out. And I'm going to help them figure out how to break out. Um, you've, I'm, I think many of you have probably seen this model before. I've, I've seen several variations of it. Bless you. I think this comes from Carl Rokey or something. Does anybody know? I think it's, it, it's something. I like to give credit where it's due, but I forget, I forget the name. But there, you'll see variations of this model. So, you have your comfort zone, right? This is the place where you feel conf confident and competent. It's B. You know, most people, their B is in their comfort zone. They're just recreating something they already know and where they already feel comfortable. If you stay in your comfort zone too long, it might still be easy, but it gets less and less comfortable. You might get in your dead zone, where you just feel uninspired and bored and everything else. This is why it's not enough for most people to be a tourist. Again, there's always part of your life that's a path, but this is why being, being on a tour is so unsatisfying. Because there's no excitement. There's, everything is comfortable. It's easy. And you're not learning anything or growing. And so it can feel dead. Like if you've if you're ever been in a job where it was really challenging at first, and then, it, and then you sort of learned it, and you got on top of it, and then you, it was fun for a while because you got good at it, and then you just you kept doing it, and you got bored with it. Have you had that experience? right? So that you went from your comfort zone to your dead zone. Your stretch zone is when you get out of your comfort zone, you do something you don't know how to do that might be a little bit risky and is obviously uncomfortable. You're not competent. You're going back to being a beginner again. That's your stretch zone. <clears throat> and if you go too far, you're in your panic zone. You're just really setting yourself up to fail. So if we're going to be provocative with our client, if we're going to challenge them to go to their edge, we want to be careful not to push them into their panic zone. We never want to challenge someone to do something that they might fail at in a way that would be harmful to them. We want them to fail in a way that they can learn. We don't want to avoid failure if, it's, if there's a good lesson. In other words, we don't want to 
avoid a risk that they can, they can recover from and learn from. <clears throat> so where is the edge? The way I think of the edge is the edge is between the stretch zone and the panic zone. That's where the real edge is. So we want to push them into something that feels like it's a little bit scary, but failure, failure, quote unquote. Dante, come to the edge, my Well, there's, I think it was Baudelaire, there's a poem about come to the edge, come, come, come to the edge, and they all came to the edge and then they flew. That's what you want. You want to get them to do the scary thing that breaks their bottle and opens them up. So when I got that woman to post, she came to the edge and she was so terrified and afraid of heights. And then she jumped and she flew. That, that's what we're looking for. That, that's the kind of edge work that we want to do. We want to lead a client to take the risk that we know will set them free, that will break their bottle and create more space. We're always trying to create more space for the client to bring more of themselves and their essence into the, into the world, to express more of it. <clears throat> so so that's, that's, the, that's edge work, is we're trying, to, we're trying to challenge them to take those risks. But they need to know that we're an ally first. We never want to set the client up for, we never want the client to risk something that's going to really hurt them. We want to know that they'll be safe and they can recover from it. So a lot of times, edge work could be something very small. You know, it's, um, remember, you can knock over the Empire State Building with 29 dominoes. Here's the Empire State Building. Here's the first domino. Each domino knocks over about one and a half times its mass. The 29th domino is as big as the Empire State Building. So the real question is, how big does the first domino have to be? And the answer is, it's about the size of a breath mint. It's this big. You... Yes. So it has to be so small. So, um, so. You know, you hear me say a lot of times, begin before you're ready. What I mean by that is we wait and wait and wait. You know, we try to figure out what the 10th domino is before we start. Uh, begin before you're ready means just knock over the first domino. You don't, don't worry about it. Nothing bad is going to happen if you knock over the first domino. A lot of entrepreneurs that I coach, they want to knock over domino 10 or 11, and they push and they push and they can't knock it over, and then they give up. And I try to tell them, no, just go back to the first domino. The first domino is the biggest, smallest thing you can do, and no, you won't fail. Biggest, meaning it has to be a meaningful step. Even though it's very small, it has to be a meaningful step. Uh, smallest, meaning you can't fail. So you're, you're going to get something from it. It might be if you're thinking about making a career change, the first domino might even be as small as just going on the internet and doing some research. You can't fail at it, but it's meaningful because it'll give you more possibilities. Or it might be going to a networking event for a group of people who are doing something that you might be interested in. If you go, you, it'll be meaningful because you'll learn something or you'll see what the people are like or what they talk about and see whether or not that interests you. You can't fail, but it's meaningful. So the first domino is the biggest, smallest thing you can do that, won't, that you know won't fail. And when you succeed at that, then the next domino is the next biggest, smallest thing that you can do and not fail. And then the third domino and you just keep knocking over dominoes. And if you knock over a few dominoes, suddenly, if you're on the right path, it's self-reinforcing, and, and you get inspired and motivated by it, and you get some momentum going. So what is edge work? Edge work is the domino 
after the biggest, smallest thing you can do and know you won't fail. <clears throat> yes, so big. So, uh, my experience with a lot of entrepreneurs is they try to knock over the 10th or 11th domino. And then, you know, they try to take on something too big and they push and they push and they can't knock it over and they, they keep not getting the result that they want and they give up. Or they burn themselves out or they run through their money or whatever it is. They should start with something smaller and figure, how, figure, figure out how to succeed at that and then just keep building. It's basically minimum viable product, sort of. Like just start with the simplest thing, simplest solution to a problem you can solve. Or even before that, just start with how do you think about it and approach it. Just keep backing up to something you know you can succeed at. And then you'll create enough momentum and then suddenly you're taking on bigger things. Daniel. You may have drawn this connection and I missed it, but yep. I, when I share this with clients, I, I think of this as, as a bottle. Yes. Right, and, that, and this is how you crack the bottle is by, yes. you, can just, you can just keep rubbing the edge of the bottle. Yeah. This is how they break the bottle from the inside. Right. Yeah. The other thing is, so I can't remember the name of the, the gentleman you said is associated with this. This is very similar to something called the zone of proximal development. Mm -hmm. Which, if you Google, it's a simpler diagram. I, I, I think the dead zone is a nice component of it because yeah. people all relate to it. But the the word? it's called the zone of proximal development. And if you mm -hmm. Google it, you'll get a similar set of onion skins. The idea of the zone of proximal development is that in human development, we need a, a loving, aiding person to help us step to that edge. And so I, I think of it as like, you know, what, what the, where the learning zone is. We, we help someone step to that edge. They need that, that space. Everything inside of that core they can do on their own. Um, this is all just to say that there are many paths up the mountain. I, I like the zone of proximal development because it's a little bit crisper. And it sounds so official. Zone of proximal development is definitely a higher fee model. Yeah. Like if you're gonna share that, you gotta get paid, right? Um, it's Carl Ronke is w where this com comes from. No, is this is this my? This model that I've just shared, to the best of my knowledge, and it's hard to find. You know, when I when I started using this, I, I've seen this model in so many different you know things. That, Training company I used to work for, for used to sometimes use this. And so then I, I believe in giving people credit. And so I tried to find it. I can't find any actual book, but I saw some reference on the internet to this person. And, and I also shared that so that if you want to learn more, you can do your own search and, and find it. Other, let me just check in with you. Other questions, comments? Ernest, do you have a question, or you're just auction, auction? Oh, okay. You you look like you're about to raise your hand, and then you. All right. Um, I don't know why. Yep. I might have done this, or adopted it, but I think it's a thing called U-Wave. Yeah. And it's just a way to learn the skills of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And so it's, then you go around the curve. Mm -hmm. Do I need to repeat it? So you win the U, so you weigh in at the beginning of the U, and you come down, and then you iterate, you know, you're going around like a racetrack, and you iterate, and you come up with your next steps. And I, I just tell my clients we're doing the you win. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, other questions, comments, reactions? Yes. Um, so if we're doing Edgework, can we get to the point where, oh, sorry. 
if we are doing some of this work and we're getting to the point where we're where the client is doing something that they might be slightly uncomfortable with something that's a little bit more risky yeah. what would you say is a good way to i guess frame a possible failure um what's the worst thing that could happen to you if that happened what would you do how do you think you would feel if that happened to you? How would you feel if you, if you did that and it didn't turn out the way you wanted? What's the worst way that it could possibly turn out? And um, could you handle that? What would you do if that happened? If you ask most people that, what they'd say is, I would feel really good that I tried it. And I would feel really shitty that it didn't work out. But I, I think I'd feel better about trying it. Now, first, of course, they're not going to say that right away. They're going to say, no fucking way. I'm not going to do that. You know, but then when you talk about it, most people will get to, yeah, OK, I could. See, see, really what it's about, what most of the edges are about are the thresholds. It's, no, if I. If I post something on LinkedIn, are you kidding? I'll be so embarrassed. What if people don't like it? What if somebody tells me it's stupid? What if somebody says, oh, I saw your post on LinkedIn? You know, it's the silliness threshold. Um, it's the knowledge threshold. They know all the reasons why it won't work. Or, they, or I don't know enough. I don't have anything to say. Yes, you do. Just go into your bones. What do you know in your bones? Everybody knows something in their bones. There's no one alive who, who doesn't know something in their bones, who hasn't learned some hard life lesson that they understand in a way that would be valuable if they shared it. And so everyone has something to say. But if you ask somebody to write something and post wherever, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, or even to just share something, people will say, some people will say, I don't know. I don't know anything. How am I supposed to write something for leaders? I've never been a leader. How can I coach leaders? I've never led anybody. This is me talking. I've never been a leader. I've never worked for a company more than three months. And that was 40 years ago, probably. Nobody has ever reported to me as their manager. But I coach CEOs. But you see, it, it's all about thresholds. It's the silliness threshold, the knowledge threshold. They're worried about trust. Can they trust people? Well, what if I, you know, what if I, what if I start a company and I get a co-founder because I'm not technical? What if I get a technical co-founder and that person, you know, steals all the money or finds a way to kick me out of the company? Or can I trust them? You know, it's it's the thresholds. OK? So the more you, so by the way, that's a good way to think about edges. What's something where someone is just, they're, they're not doing something that they know they want to do, and they're not taking the next step because they're afraid of losing face? What's a way, what's, what's an experiment I can get them to conduct where they'll risk embarrassing themselves in a way that they can recover from safely? That's how you think about edge work. How can I get them to do something they don't know how to do? How can I get them to begin before they're ready? <clears throat> um, you were talking about, I mean, what would yeah. you, you um, program to do in terms of teaching them to do a trust threshold? Um, Trust something that you can recover from. Yeah. I had, a client, I had a client who had a big issue around trust. He was a solopreneur, and in his business, he wanted to grow his business, but he just, he just didn't trust people. And so I said, you know, like, he was afraid to hire people because then what if they, you know, what if they didn't work out and whatever? And I said, 
look, if you want to scale your business, you, you can only be so big by yourself. If scaling is the thing that you really care about, you're going to have to build a mountain underneath you. You're going to have to work with other people and get other people to support what you're doing. So if you're afraid, why don't you just contract some people? Just see what that's like. And that's, that's what he did. And so he contracted with someone, and he, he worked with that person as if they were a partner. And, um, you know, I don't, think, I don't think they ever became partners, but he, that enabled him to do some bigger things and to, more importantly for him, he wanted some more freedom in his life because being a solopreneur is like, you know, you're responsible for everything, and he was burning out. So, um, so he learned how to trust by just sort of building slowly. What about for the love threshold? For the love threshold? Yeah, what would you provoke? <clears throat> um, it depends on how the love threshold is showing up. You know, like if it's a personal, if it's in their personal life and their relationships, I would just challenge them to go on a date. Like, you know, start, that's a good experiment, good fun experiment. I went on 30 some before I met my beloved. You know? But, I mean, that is a good example. Like, if you talk to people personally and you say, and, and people do come to you with all kinds of personal things. I have coached CEOs on dating. And, you know, I always tell them to, all right, are you, are you ready? Are you really ready? I'm ready. Okay. Get out a spreadsheet. <laughs> here's what you're going to do we're going to go on a quest for your beloved and here's what you're going to do you're going to track it you're going to go on 50 dates you can't get discouraged until you've gone on 50 dates and the other important thing is you have to show up as fully as you can as yourself on those 50 dates no seduction you can't put on a good face you can't try to be someone you're not you show up as yourself and you see what happens so that's love threshold stuff, because it's like, what if I get rejected? What if they reject me before I reject them? You know, it's vulnerable. So, um, but it really depends on, it depends on what it is. So what about for sanity, would you encourage them to like do too much? Well, what I might encourage them to do if I thought it was safe is to take on more. Like sometimes people will be afraid to take on more grow or scale in some way because they are afraid of being overwhelmed. They're afraid like, you know, there's no way I could do that. If I did that, I'd be completely overwhelmed. And so then I, I might say, all right, well, let's, let's design an experiment. What could we do where if you did get overwhelmed, you could recover from it? Or what could we do, what's another way to grow, make a bigger bottle without being overwhelmed? Maybe part of it is, again, maybe it's you need to work with somebody else. Maybe you need some help. What would it look like if it was easy? Yeah, what would it look like if it was easy? That's a, a great question. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Other questions about this? All right. Um, edge work is sometimes the gap between capability and identity. So we talked about imposter syndrome briefly. Imposter syndrome is where your capability is up here and your identity is down here. So what we, a good edge work experiment is to get someone to do something that challenges the belief that their identity is down here, that challenges their capability. And we can see it and we know that they're capable and that they're gonna succeed, but we challenge their identity. And we invite them to do something that feels not like themselves, you know? Like, um, what do you mean? Ask her to dance? I could never ask her to dance. I don't know how to dance. Yeah, you do. You got the moves. <laughs> you know, it's just like you just, you, you, you can see what they're capable of, but they can't see it, and so you challenge their identity. You challenge that gap between their identity and what they're actually capable of. <clears throat> All right. Um, yeah. So some some strategies for edge work is you want to conduct. You want to encourage them to conduct experiments. 
to knock over the first domino or the next domino. Uh, you want to create fast feedback cycles. The, the important thing is to help people learn quickly. That's how you go on a good quest. The faster they learn, the more fun they start having. And the more momentum they get, the more inspired they are, the bigger their bottle, the more they see that more could be possible for them. And so it's important to keep that momentum going. By the way, that's thrust. So in your coaching conversations, if you, have a, if you do a dream session or you're coaching someone and they say, well, you know, that was really great, but um, I don't feel like I'm making enough progress or I want you to tell me what to do or whatever, that means they're not getting enough thrust. You need, to, you need to be more provocative in your coaching with that client. They're not happy because there's too much lift and it's, it's not feeling challenging enough. I remember, I think this was my first like conscious edge. I was 18, freshman year of college and I, had, I went to the University of Massachusetts and I knew within a couple of months that it was not the right place for me. And um, I was, I felt lost, I felt frustrated, I felt like I had been, made a big mistake, I felt a lot of regret and shame, mm -hmm. and I was afraid, and I was avoiding telling the truth mm -hmm. um, to my parents, and definitely covering up the pain with, you know, various substances. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, you know, I, it was a chance for me to say what I wanted, yeah. and this was such a formative experience for me, because I felt like there was this you know, thankfully, you know, with the grace of, you know, my, my parents, they were, they helped me choose and they helped me see that there was an opening and that there was choice. Mm -hmm. And ultimately I, I said what I wanted. I wanted to study radio and I wanted to go to the top radio station, um, college radio station in the country, which is what brought me to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately I got in, I wanted to just, that was, I only wanted to apply to one place and I was like, if I don't get in there, I'll go to LA and figure it out, figure it out. But I was like, I want that. And I, I felt like I, it was like this experience of being open mm -hmm. and like really like letting myself feel called forward. And I had to trust. And I also had to get really present and appreciate where I was, even though I knew it wasn't where my future was going to be. Like I, it, I felt like it was a real pivotal point in making me the positive person that I am now because I, I had to love where I was and also like shoot for the moon um, and trust that it was all going to work out. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, you have a radio voice. You have a good radio voice. Are we, are we good now? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's have one more. Um, for Drew. Okay. <clears throat> So this is probably not the only time I was on the edge, but probably the most dramatic one. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in academia for several decades. I went through master's, PhD, and postdoc. Mm -hmm. um, and I graduated my PhD in 2009, and I went on market in 2008, when we all know what happened in 2008. Uh, housing yep. market crash, and all the jobs were gone, and all I was getting, getting was um, not even rejection, like cancellation job so it was it was really depressing at the end of my postdoc I decided to leave academia which was a dramatic move for me because academia is like a family business for me mom and dad have been all academics and mm. um, so when I decided that success was uncertain I was very afraid uh, my dad wouldn't talk to me for three months and that was the first time and the only time I hung up on my mom on the phone um, well, here's my first domino. At the time, I didn't think of it as domino, but now it's like the first domino. Uh, I opened up monster.com, probably the first and only time I opened it up, and I looked for any kind of jobs that might, I might be fit for. Anybody who spent a lot of time in academia knows the feeling that they're really not qualified for anything. <laughs> So with that self-confidence, <laughs> I identified three roles one of which was online community manager because I had an internet research background, UX research, and some, some sort of social media openings. And I started applying. And within a couple of weeks, I started getting interviews, mm. none of which I was, I hit it, but I mean, I was getting interviews, so that was like a big, um, and then this company, you know, ADP, um, was pursuing me a headhunter. I bombed the first interview, 
I thought I'd never make it, and then they called back. And then I, next thing you know, in about a week, I was driving over to Pasadena from Wisconsin, mm. and I couldn't believe that I was seeing palm trees around me when I rolled into <laughs> California. So that's my edge work. Great, thank you. Now, um, does everyone here have a similar story? Is there anyone here who doesn't have a story of going through an edge and surviving? Okay, congratulations. Everybody, I have a not so happy story. You, you have a not so happy yeah. story? Okay. Not all, not all edge stories are happy, but are you here? I am. Did you survive? I did. Did you learn something? Yeah. Did you grow? Yeah. You navigated it? Yeah. Okay. Everybody in this room survived. More importantly, everybody in this room knows in their bones what it's like to navigate an edge, a meaningful edge. So I don't have to say anything more about it. You're all edge workers. Okay? Now here's what I'd like you to do. Now that I've reminded you of just, you know, what kind of edge workers you are, I'm going to invite you to your next edge. So, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so yesterday morning, we went through A to B and we talked about a quest and everything and I asked you to come up with a B, the best that you could imagine for your life. What would it look like to create a life that you love? The biggest container, bigger than your coaching practice and everything else, a life that's big enough to hold the biggest, best, ideal coaching practice you want, plus your major chord, whatever it is for you. The other things that you have to have for all of your life to work out. And so the invitation now is for you to think of what is the next real edge for you. And remember, the edge, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It's just the domino after the domino that you know is the biggest, smallest thing that you know won't fail. This is the next biggest, smallest thing that you could do that you might fail. Success isn't assured, but it's a meaningful next step to creating the life you love. So I'm going to give you uh, a few minutes to do some rapid journaling, what would be the next edge? And, um, and then if we have time, I'm gonna have you just get with a partner and just share what it is so that you can't hide it. Okay, so take a few minutes to think about the next edge. Remember the next edge doesn't have to be a big thing. It's just the next thing that is meaningful that success isn't assured. It's risky. You could get a lesson instead of what you want. 